You're famous for these end of one experiments where you're, <laughs> you're testing yourself, you're pushing your limits, and now so many people are wearing monitoring devices, they have access to lots of data. What advice mm -hmm. would you have to people who want to experiment and to see what's optimal for them? And maybe could you also tell the story of your seven day fast and the deadlifting? <laughs> Yeah, that gets around. Uh, Tim Ferriss mentioned, I didn't know he was going to mention that on the podcast, but I guess Peter Atia told him, told him about the story. Uh, so, okay, so monitoring. So, right, so what, what can the person out there listening right now do? They can go to their local CVS, Walgreens, drugstore, uh, Amazon, and buy a glucose and ketone monitoring system, right? And they can simply, it would be good to know their glucose response to a meal. That's very important from a health perspective. You don't want to be, you don't want to have glucose excursions up to like 200 milligrams per nanogram. You know, you want to stay, you know, under 120. So uh, I would say try intermittent fasting, perhaps the time restricted eating protocol with low carbohydrate diet, perhaps starting at 100 grams or less per day and then working down to 50. And over a period of time, you can check your blood ketone levels, and once you're above 0.5, you are clinically in a state of ketosis. And for a diabetic, a type one diabetic person who's not on a ketogenic diet, that could be dangerous, but for us, that, that's a good thing. So diabetic ketoacidosis is very, very different <laughs> than nutritional ketosis. And my PhD student, uh, Andrew Kutnick, did a TEDx talk uh, that you can look up which talks about that subject, a type one diabetic using nutritional ketosis to manage his disorder. So that's all I'll say about that. But I get a lot of questions about type one diabetes. So I just, you know, refer to Andrew's uh, TEDx talk. So for nutritional ketosis, you want to be 0.5 or above, ideally around the one to two millimolar range. Check your ketones. Uh, typically later in the day when you've had some, some ketogenic meals in you or you're fasting, and see how you feel. And also, maybe when you're not measuring, see how you feel subjectively when you have the most energy, when you have the most lucidity and mental mental uh, resilience, I guess you could say. Uh, I, when I get into these phases, I'll do a lot of writing or a lot of sort of tasks that require a lot of you know cognitive. And I will tend to check my, my glucose and ketones. And I typically find that my ketones are in like the one to two and maybe upwards to the three range. And some people I know actually get much higher. There's people in the lab that are like running four or five and other people that are on a strict ketogenic diet and can barely even make it to that one millimolar range. So everybody's going to be a little bit different. So buy a meter online. They're relatively cheap under 50 bucks. The strips if you search around, you can get them for anywhere between a dollar to two dollars a strip and and get some some data on yourself, experimenting yourself. And then from there, you can start evaluating other things. So I use an aura sleep uh, ring and for sleep, and the aura ring monitors a number of different factors. Most importantly for me, it, it's a pretty good measurement of your sleep time and sleep architecture, like how much, you know, delta sleep you're getting and REM sleep and things. And uh, and I we use this for our, our NASA extreme environment mission operations sort of mission too on the crew members. So it's a very hardy technology. I mean, you can train with it and it'd be hard to break it actually. Uh, so monitoring your sleep with a Fitbit or an Aura Ring, measuring your glucose and ketone levels, uh, I think is a good place to start, right? And then we all have certain things. Like I know my strength. I keep a, a training journal or used to keep, you know, very detailed records of training journal. And then you could, whether you're a runner or a cyclist or whatever, you know, start monitoring this, get your baseline, initiate the ketogenic diet or uh, exogenous ketones or intermittent fasting, whatever you want to do, and uh, monitor your your blood ketone levels, and then assess those things that you're interested in. You know your performance times, not just subjectively but objectively, right? And monitor your sleep because your sleep will be a factor in those. You know, performance too. Get general blood work, CBC, CMP. Uh, you know, do get a lot of baseline data because it's going to be important. I think for me, I never thought I would continue with the diet. I was just doing it from an intellectual perspective and in that I wanted to understand uh, what it 
felt like for my brain to run off a different energy source. So <laughs> I became obsessed with this about 10 years ago. And, uh, and I was very inspired by the work of George Cahill at Harvard Medical School, where he fasted subjects for 40 days. And, uh, and was able to, I had some conversations with uh, Dr. Cahill. He passed away in 2012. And a lot of the icons are up in their 80s and 90s, pushing 100 now. And many of them are still alive. They did uh, go on to, to live extremely productive lives and uh, contributed massively to metabolic physiology. We just don't have the metabolic physiologists nowadays that we had back in the day. But uh, I was really inspired by his work and actually wanted to fast for seven days, not 40 days. So uh, I did uh, quite a lot of blood work before, during, and after and was able to get my blood glucose down uh, uh, to a level that was significantly below my ketone levels. So my ketones were at, at the end stage about double what my blood glucose was. And because ketones can readily cross the blood-brain barrier, we can say that uh, roughly two-thirds of my brain energy was being run off ketones. And during that time, I actually worked on a lot of grants and was very productive and actually getting got funding off of one of the big grants I worked on during that time. I was teaching and even at the end of it, I went to the gym and tested my strength and found that like my strength did go down a little bit, uh, but I didn't push myself too hard because I knew, you know, I was thinking I'm fragile. I, I just wanted to be kind of uh, cautious as to moving weight under that kind of condition. But I did find which was really interesting to me that my strength did not take a big hit. Uh, and I was semi keto adapted because for about a half a year to a year or so I had been tinkering with the ketogenic diet, the clinical ketogenic diet, and it really made fasting pretty easy. The third day I was kind of hurting, but after seven days, I mean, I was lucid enough to be sharp and give lectures and, uh, and had the energy to move, you know, five, six plates on a deadlift. You know, I never thought going into this, I would have never, I thought, you know, after four or five days, you'd be so weak. You, it'd be hard to stand up, you know, that you'd have, and I did have orthostatic hypotension in the beginning. I'd stand, so I had to get, uh, I would have soup broth, but no calories, you know, I'd have sodium and water and fluids and things like that to stay hydrated. Yeah. Your insulin goes down, right? So insulin's role is sodium reabsorption in the kidneys, right? So if your, your insulin levels down, you're dumping a lot of sodium. So I think in the beginning I was drinking a lot of water, but not getting the sodium that I needed. And once I started getting the sodium in, it's like I started kind of waking up, my blood pressure came back up again. Uh, and, uh, I remember kind of sodium loading before, you know, uh, I had to do a thinking task or, or work out or something like that. But I would go for like long walks, you know, at the time, just very easy walks and that my ketone levels would get up. I'd come back and my glucose would be in a range that the meter wouldn't even detect. It would just say low. It would just say low and it wouldn't even detect it. And uh, and I tinkered with a few things to get my, my glucose down really low. I don't know exactly how low I got it because the meter wouldn't wouldn't register it and, and my ketone's pretty high. And, uh, and realize that um, this really does make you resilient. Your body feels kind of numb in a way, like, but at the same time, your senses are heightened. So I would go for a walk and I could smell things or maybe even see things uh, sharper than I could, could otherwise. So now I, I got the full understanding of when, when people fast and they say it brings them to another level. Uh, and I think the more you do it, the easier it gets and probably the more benefits you derive from it too. So, I mean, you could tell like, major things were happening in your body, <laughs> you know, major things are happening like autophagy. Uh, of course, like you, when you force your brain to go from glucose to ketones, luckily the brain is incredibly metabolically flexible in its fuel utilization and it can make that switch. Uh, not everybody can. I mean, some people may have a harder time than others, but like I said, the more you do it, the easier it gets and the more benefits you derive from it. And I think it can be a very, uh, I mean, I did it for scientific sort of reasons, but it's also sort of a personal uh, journey too. So you, you learn about a lot about yourself, what you can and can't take, you know, how resilient you really are. And you think, man, if I was dropped off, uh, I got lost or something and had limited food availability, you know, at least I know, you know, I could, I could get through it and not die after, you know, two or three days of not eating. Um, 
So that was, uh, I encourage people to do that, but I don't make the recommendation. I'm not a medical doctor, right? So <laughs> not telling people to go out and do it. So. 